Hello, everyone. First, to our staff, trustees, volunteers, members, donors, and friends, let me thank all of you for your continued support of the Sharon Historical Society and Museum. Without your dedication to this remarkable organization, none of the incredible work we're doing would be possible. And it's a very special time to be a supporter of the Sharon Historical Society in one form or another. We're undertaking the very ambitious task of telling the story of this town in a new permanent exhibit, a narrative that centers around the local iron industry, both its intended efforts and unintended consequences. It is a far-reaching story with powerful lessons from the past. And that's what I want to focus on today. My approach to studying and teaching history consists of identifying those facts that inform the world we live in, imparting crucial life lessons, teaching us how to live our best lives as individuals. Today, I want to share one story with you that I think teaches us a lot. It's a story that many of you have likely heard before, in part because any historian stands on the shoulders of giants. Men like Ed Kirby, who dedicated his life to the history of this incredible town and the broader region. I begin on the morning of May 2nd, 1887. On that day, a young woman of 17 years passed through the gates of Ellis Island and stepped foot on American soil after a week-long voyage across the Atlantic. She would have been hard to miss, standing over six feet tall with merry blue eyes and curly blonde hair. Augusta Malquit arrived with two acquaintances, none of whom could speak a word of English. It must have been an intimidating experience. The bustling streets of New York were, after all, a far cry from the small Burgundian village in France where she was born. Intending to live with her extended family in Connecticut, Augusta ended up on the wrong train, arriving in Albany instead of Bridgeport. Thanks to the intercession of a French-speaking restaurateur, she eventually found her way to Sharon Mountain, where she settled in with her cousins, working as a domestic servant in their house. In two years, Augusta not only learned English, but, as her granddaughter would later recount, quote, she had found the wonderful world of books and the printed word. She never ceased to study whenever she could. At the end of this period, Augusta was reunited with her sweetheart. Emile Jasmine followed his lady love to America, and they married in Sharon on March 4th, 1890. In need of money, the couple hatched an idea. The Barnum and Richardson Company, a major producer of railroad car wheels, was in desperate need of high quality charcoal to power over a dozen iron furnaces in the area. Dressed in a tailor-made gray flannel suit with a fitted jacket and full-length skirt, Augusta arrived at the offices of company owner Milo Richardson. Impressed with her knowledge of charcoal, Mr. Richardson placed an order for one ton. When she arrived home, Emile was flabbergasted. He was only one man. To fill an order of that size, he would need an entire crew working day and night with a team of horses for dragging logs. According to family legend, Augusta responded, work never killed anybody, and work she did. To fund the venture, she went to a banker, presenting him with a plan to break into the charcoal business. By the end of the meeting, the Jasmine Company was born. Emile and Augusta both understood the value of the hardwoods on Sharon Mountain and with their crew worked at all hours of the day making charcoal. Soon, their first order was fulfilled. Mr. Richardson was so satisfied with the final product that he granted Augusta an unrestricted contract for all the charcoal her company could produce. For over 20 years, the Jasmine Company fulfilled that contract, developing a reputation for quality and fair dealings. Augusta, a woman who towered over most people, became something of a local legend and was known in most circles as Charcoal Annie. Her husband, Gentle Emile, served as the company's foreman, but everyone knew Augusta was the boss. She housed her crew of 18 men and fed them four meals a day, seven days a week, all the while raising four children of her own, born over a span of five years. She kept meticulous records, maintained strict discipline, and allowed only one visit to the saloon per month. And by the way, these rules applied to her husband as well. 
One night, Emil and the crew went into town for their monthly trip. When they didn't return in the morning, Augusta went looking for them. She quickly learned that they had been arrested for, quote, disturbing the peace with their singing on Main Street after midnight. We can all be sure they got an earful once released. In the ensuing years, the size of the crew doubled, and their operation grew more complex as deforestation forced them to move around. The crew lived in portable shanty towns that could be transported to a new location when necessary. But after more than two decades, time finally caught up with the Jasmine Company. Railroad lines crisscrossed the country at this point, and it became cheaper to import charcoal from Vermont and West Virginia, rather than relying on ever-dwindling forests in northwest Connecticut. But this did not deter Augusta and Emil. They bought a sawmill, supplying local builders with lumber. Now in their 50s, the couple finally retired in 1921, living on a small farm in Canton, Connecticut. Shortly thereafter, Augusta became an American citizen. The judge presiding over her swearing-in inquired about where she had been educated. She replied, Your Honor, I taught myself. With the passage of the 19th Amendment, Augusta even had the right to vote, though her husband, still a non-citizen, did not. In 1950, she died at the age of 80, leaving behind 10 grandchildren, whose descendants live across Connecticut's northwest corner to this day. Augusta Malquit Jasmine was a woman who defied every norm of her time, who landed on these shores with passion in her heart and purpose in her eyes. Hers is a quintessentially American story of self-reliance, hard work, and limitless determination. I tell this inspiring tale because it reveals much about the world we live in today. The material wealth of the modern age didn't just happen. Humans didn't always have abundant energy, smartphones in their pockets, life-saving medicines, or transportation that could bring us halfway around the world in a matter of hours. All of these marvelous inventions had to be created. You can't just pick an iPhone off a tree after all. To arrive at something as complex as an iPhone, you need a long chain of production over time, with producers making constant improvement and exerting constant effort. Charcoal Annie was one such early producer, whose work built and shaped our world. Through her effort and the effort of many others, the material resources around us were converted into complex machines capable of performing tasks that would be impossible for a human being. But a century earlier, Charcoal Annie could never have achieved the success that she painstakingly earned. Her week-long trip across the Atlantic in 1887, though long by today's standards, would have taken, on average, at least six weeks a hundred years earlier, and sometimes as long as two or three months. If she had survived this journey... She would not have found businesses like Barnum and Richardson in need of her services, providing as much charcoal as she could produce. The infrastructure simply didn't exist. She wouldn't have been able to find a bank willing to lend her the money to start her own company. A century earlier, it's unlikely that she would have attained such a position of authority, nor would she have been afforded the right to vote. So what changed in those hundred years? What gave rise to the conditions that enabled a woman like Charcoal Annie to thrive and flourish? The complete answer to this question would take longer than I have time for today, but it's this transformation that is at the centerpiece of our upcoming permanent exhibit. And if I could offer a short version of the answer, I would say this. The 19th century was the most transformative hundred years in human history. There was an explosion in population, general health, standard of living, and life expectancy, especially the survival rate of young children. Average income and global wealth skyrocketed. Suddenly, life was not just a matter of repeating the same motions, laboring endlessly out in a field, but an existence full of choices, values, and personal pursuits. With the aid of time-saving machines, People spent less income on food, less laboring for their basic survival, thereby freeing up time to pursue all the things that make life worth living. For the first time in human history, people in large numbers began to pursue romantic love rather than marriage as a purely economic institution. Human survival is not just a matter of having enough food to eat, 
water to drink, or air to breathe. Human beings have spiritual needs. They need purpose and self-esteem. They have to know that their lives are worth living. For instance, before the 19th century, if you wanted to be an artist, your choice was either to find a wealthy patron, usually some kind of nobility, or starve to death. Most ended up as the latter. Great artists and composers like Mozart, Chopin, Byron, Shelley, John Keats, and Emily Bronte all died before their 40th birthdays. Though the 19th century didn't get rid of starving artists, because of the mass creation of wealth and the emergence of a middle class, it opened up a wide range of possibilities for people of all types for the first time ever. And it should be no surprise then that this century saw an explosion in the arts, impacting our town and the whole world. The vibrant arts community of Sharon, Connecticut, that we all enjoy and appreciate, owes its existence to the work of industrial revolutionaries. Because of the wealth they created, because of the time they saved us, every hour not spent tilling the soil to make your own food means an hour gained for work that you find fulfilling, for the consumption of great art, for recreation, hobbies, etc. And although there were still plenty of problems in the 1800s, both new and old, we should remember it as the century where everything changed. Most of all, it was a century of producers, equipped with the newfound freedom to exercise the capacities of their minds, to pursue their values, to achieve their happiness. Here at the Sharon Historical Society, we've dedicated ourselves to studying these lessons from the Iron Industrial Age. Our work is not finished, and we have a lot left to say. With the full backing of this organization and everyone listening, we can't wait to share this story with you. Thank you.